Hello again and welcome to the 140k Modern Glory video and today guys we will be getting into a controversial topic. We will be talking about the new regiments of renown that were announced by Games Workshop last week. Now some of you might be saying Modern Glory you're coming awfully late to the regiments of renown controversy. It's like well yes I am but there's a little bit of a reason for that. I kind of wanted to let the dust settle. And maybe, maybe I should jump on the bandwagon and get these things out hot off the presses and join in the controversy. But I don't, I don't really like to join in controversy. I don't really like to join in the, the shit stirring. What I want to do is, with this video, is I want to explain to some of the newer players into the community why people were getting so hacked off about Regiments of Renown. And why... In the previous edition, 8th edition, people got a little bit scared and a little wobbly and to be honest in many cases were downright pissed off and could be very much argued justifiably at specialist attachments which were introduced in the 8th edition Vigilus Defiant and Vigilus Ablaze supplements. Now, the reason where this all comes from, why does every time Games Workshop announce something like Regiments of Renown or Specialist Attachments why do some players in the 40k community go total pants on head frothing at the mouth mad to be honest myself included in some ways to a less definitely to a lesser extent though why do some of the people go ah no games workshop it's a return of formations why is there this level of mental scarring quite literally ptsd within the warhammer community around this thing called formations Okay, to be honest guys, formations were a thing that were responsible for almost sinking Warhammer 40k, almost sinking Games Workshop and it is the reason why 8th edition is considered by many longbeards in the community to be a hard reset and 8th edition was a Hail Mary, it was an all or nothing to, for Games Workshop to save itself. Okay, there's no, that is not an overstatement. If 8th edition had failed, then we would not have Games Workshop. It is simple as I would, I think, at this time now, Games Workshop would be closing its doors. Okay, that is how much formations almost broke 40k and almost destroyed Games Workshop as a company. Now that sounds like an exaggeration. I promise you, it's not. I'm not saying these things to get clicks or likes or anything like that, okay? I'm saying these things as someone who genuinely, you know, played through all of six, all of seventh, and saw, and basically, you know, not to sound, not to exaggerate it, but someone who literally survived that from a gaming standpoint, okay? I'm a seventh edition survivor, all right? And seventh edition, honestly, was, it has such a bad rap and it deserves that rap, okay? It deserves it, okay? Now, what what the hell are these formations? Things? Why were people see people so angry about them? Okay, what formations were? They were a concept that Games Workshop introduced in um, seventh edition that essentially were along the lines of if you take a certain group of units that could be maybe justified from a narrative point of view, then you will receive a bunch of additional bonuses. Now on the surface, that sounds cool. And it sounds like you, you know, Games Workshop would be using those formations to reward players who bring fluffy forces. I mean, that's what we always want, right? You know, if you've got the guy that turns up with his first company scouts, oh, sorry, 10th company scouts, um, for his Space Marine army or his first company Deathwing army and he's playing with a self-imposed handicap but it's a really cool army then you want that guy to be rewarded he's put the effort in to bringing an awesome themed force he should be rewarded for that that is what the sort of concept of formations were however like so many things in life it's like, it's like a general rule for life um, the way something was intended to work and its actual intention and actual outcome, I should say, um, were totally opposite. So Games Workshop wanted formations to be a way of rewarding fluffy players and they turned out to be something that were totally broken and allowed for competitive players to essentially break the game. 
And it's thanks to things like formations, because the, create, the worst thing about formations is not every faction had access to them, and not all formations were created equally. So I think at some point nearly every faction did have access to them, but they were so imbalanced that they were so unfairly written that you had this two-tier system where you had a few elite armies, special armies, that had access to just insane formations um, and literally armies that um, without these formations would have been totally fine, but with the formations became utterly broken. Um, and it was those are, and it was literally, does your army have good formations? You will be in the top tier. Does your army have no formations or has poor formations? You will be in the bottom tier. And that is simply that. So, and the disparity between these things and the power disparity and the imbalance and just the general brokenness of certain formations with certain factions simply it has scarred the Warhammer community. It, it literally it is something that Games Workshop will never be able to get away with, will never get away from and will never and people will net people will not tolerate it. Okay. The moment there's even a whiff, even if these things were just for narrative play, people would still, still, the PTSD would kick in, the mental scar would still kick in, they would just go nuts about them, they would hate them. That's how, that's to give you an idea of how broken these things were. Think of something that you think is almost totally unreasonable and broken, and I guarantee it was a, it was a thing for a certain faction. So here's, let's go through a few examples. So I'm talking about these, these general concepts of imbalance and broken. You've got that now. You understand that. I spent six minutes basically repeating myself. What's important is to give specific examples. Okay. And I'm going to go through a few, I'm going to go through three or four specific examples of things that you just would be like, that's insane. How did that ever get out of the balance department? If there ever was a, was a balance department. So the first one is the Space Marine Gladius Detachment, probably one of the more infamous ones, one of the more well-known ones. Essentially, Space Marines were given a detachment where if you took um, like a captain and a chaplain and then some tactical squads and uh, some devastated squads and some assault squads, so all foot slogging firstborn marines you know your classic your captain your chaplain your tactical squad your assault squad your devastator squad or you know you take you sort of take one of each of those things um then you know that's that's really cool because you're not taking terminator or anything you're taking your power it was power armor if you take basically a power armor army a space army then all of your transports rhinos and razorbacks were free cost zero points any upgrades you put on them zero points just imagine that so you turn up with 2000 points imagine my black templar black tide army it's 100 marines you turn up with you turn up with the you know 100 imagine if i could you know turn up with 100 marines and then they all have a free transport so what you had was someone who had a 2,000 point list or back in the day it was 1850 you had an 1850 points list so me as my guard player I turn up with 1850 points and my opponent turns up with 1850 you know in air quotes but really he's got close to 3,000 points because every because he's turning up with a dozen literally a dozen free transports and every single one of them has got twin las cannon or twin assault cannon. And that's legal. But he's his arm is technically 1850. But really he's turning up with a 3,000 point list. That was released and was allowed in tournaments and was balanced. According to Games Workshop. That was fair. Obviously it wasn't. It was totally and utterly, excuse my language, cover your children's ears, totally and utterly fucked. Okay, it was just not, it just doesn't work, obviously. And then they had another one, appropriate that knights are now on the screen. So you had something called the war convocation. If you take a, this is when Admec and, this is when Admec was split into two factions. You had Adeptus Mechanicus and you had Skitari and they were two separate codexes. 
obvious cash grab. Um, you had, if you took an army of, if you took half your army as Adep as Deptus Mechanicus and you took half your army as Guitari and you were allied in an Imperial Knight, then all your upgrades, all your equipment across the whole army was free. Every Plasma Cavalier, every Arc Rifle, every Power Maul, every single upgrade on that knight, every upgrade in the whole army was free. So again, you had people. I turn up with my 1850 point Imperial Guard list. My opponent turns up with a War Convocation, and he's actually, you know, in equivalent points, if he paid for all of his things, he's running 2,500 points. Broken. Doesn't work. So those are a couple of examples of where Games Workshop just literally just gave stuff away for free, but not every faction had access to something like that. If there was an equivalent formation in every single faction, and Pilgar got access to free Chimeras and Toroxes, Dark Elder got access to free Venoms and Raiders, Orcs got access to free trucks and battle wagons, if everyone had access to equal amounts of free shit, it probably wouldn't have been a problem. But as we are seeing in 9th edition, it Games Workshop does not treat every faction equally. Why are there two Wound Tactical Marines and one Wound Chaos Space Marines? Because Games Workshop hasn't got around to updating them yet. It's the same thing that happened in 7th edition and happened with formations. And same thing happened in 8th edition. Everyone was like, it's okay. You know, special attachments, they're, you know, they're a bit gaming, they're a bit janky. But, you know, eventually every faction will have access to them. Wrong. The majority of Xenos factions didn't get access to any specialist attachments. So, just because Games Workshop is releasing regiments of renown for some factions, it is absolutely no guarantee that they are going to release them for every faction. And straight away, that creates significant imbalance. Now, a couple of other examples of these broken formations that aren't just free stuff being given away. I mean, actually, let's go for one. Let's go for one more example of one just being a freebie. Okay. Games work, and this is one of the formations. What we're going to go into now is Tau is 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 Tau. Okay. Now, many people, and there's a bit of a meme in the 40k community of hating on Tau. Tau, one of the most disliked factions in the real world. I'm not talking about in game, but in the real world, Tau is one of the most disliked factions. You can't ever really put your finger on it. It's just what you know. You, you just think, oh, why, why do people hate Tau so much? Why do Tau get such a bad name? Tau always had a little bit of a bad name, but nothing really. I mean, it was it was fine throughout most of the editions up until sixth edition, um, and then seventh edition came in, and these formations came in, and what because of how broken Games Workshop made some of the Tau formations. It has literally tarred and feathered and tattooed and carved into the forehead of the Tau community that their army is bullshit. And even when Tau are in the absolute gutter now, in 9th edition, when Tau are considered one of the most bottom factions, so they basically can't play 9th edition very well at all, people still go, ha, well the Tau deserve it. Why is that? Okay, why do people do that? Why is it this like toxic element in the 40k community of uh, on you know of really really hating on tower players look i i say i i go oh yeah bloody tower players you know i it's a bit you know i'll hold my hands up you know i got a bit you know I, but a lot of it for me is you know tongue-in-cheek and also because when i was a kid me i only ever used to play against tower because my brother had tower and i had guard i had no idea what he was doing he's five years old than me he knew what he was doing so i used to get my ass beaten in by tower every single game and it's a bit of a joke it's a bit of a play on the whole childhood sort of issue of you know play you know your bigger brother beating on you with it with it with his with his tower army kind of thing so that's where mine comes from mine's more of a bit of a joke i lean into it it's more of a a meme on this channel you can say like it's like a bit of an in joke on the old mordian glory channel same with the whole you know i think sort of from games workshop is spying on me joke let's say like, we've got a couple of we've got a couple of in jokes here. we've got a couple of memes here um but why does the rest of the forge why is it but by and large there is still this kind of hatred towards hatred is a strong word negative feeling towards the Tau players and Tau faction. Why does this persist in many older players? Well, it is thanks to 7th edition and the uh, Piranha Firestream Wing and the 
Riptide Wing. Those are the two formations that uh, basically, almost basically associated Tau with being broken and overpowered, even when they're not, and why people kind of think they deserve the shithole they're in now. So the first one is, talking about freebies again, the Piranha Firestorm Wing. Okay, now this had a, this formation was you must take four units of Piranhas, which means you can take 12 Piranhas, I think, maybe even more. I think you can take up to five Piranhas in a squad, but let's be safe, I don't want to exaggerate things. Let's say you can take three Piranhas in a squad. Now bear in mind, you can take more than one of the same formation. You can take, I think back in the day, the traditional thing to do was you could take two detachments. And so you could turn up with two of these piranha, piranha wings, which is 24 piranhas, if not more. Okay, I'm pretty sure, you know, I think you can take five as well, but I'm not sure. Anyway, boys, you can turn it with an absolute boatload of piranhas. And each one of these piranhas came with two drones. Okay, so if you're turning up with 24 piranhas, that means you're turning up with 48 drones. Okay. Now, this is a problem when you read out the following special rule that this formation gets. Rearm and refuel. If all of the surviving models from a unit in this formation are within six inches of a table edge at the end of their movement phase, the unit can enter ongoing reserves. When it returns to play, it does so at full strength with any damage repaired and drones and seeker missiles replaced. So what that means is, is you backline your 24 piranhas, or however many piranhas you're turning up with, and turn one, you fire all your seeker missiles off, so you've got a lot of crack missiles there. You fire all your seeker missiles off, and you release all your drones. You just go, I'm going to release my drones. Okay, or you can just, beginning of your turn... You don't even fire your secret missiles. I mean, you can fire secret missiles, but at the beginning of your turn, you just dump 48 drones onto the board. Everyone, all 48 drones get out. End of your movement phase? Oh, well, I've disembarked all my drones. The end of the movement phase, I guess I'll take all my piranhas off the board. Turn two comes along. You come back in from reserves. Oh, well, I come in from reserves at the beginning of my turn, so... I come in, I disembark all my drones again, that's another 48 drones, and then, oh, at the end of my phase, I'm back in, I'm back still six inches from the table edge, so I'll go back into reserves. Turn three, I come back in. And so what it meant is basically every single turn, you could flood the board with drone after drone after drone. And you didn't have to take everyone off all the time. You could, like I said, you could spend turn one seeking missile and the crap out of everything, go off, come back on. You could just constantly... Just go off, seek a missile, and you could get like three waves of seeker missiles going out. You could get five waves of drones, and you just swarmed the whole board, and no one could do anything about it. So you talk about free models. Imagine getting free 50 drones every turn. I mean, that's just insanity. So that was one thing. That was actually one of the lesser known things. Well, not, not as many people went for that. What people went for was the Riptide Wing. This quite simply destroyed 7th edition, this formation. You thought Riptides were powerful in 8th. You ain't seen nothing yet. So, essentially, the Riptides had a special rule in their, um, in their, on their data sheet, which said that they could fire twice. That wasn't even in this formation. They could just fire twice. Okay. Uh, if you took them in a Riptide Wing, which meant you could take three Riptides, which meant that you could turn up to battle with... I think you could take three formations in some tournaments, so you could turn up with just nine Riptides. You didn't need anything else. Didn't need anything else. So you turn up to the battlefield with, like, nine Riptides. Or maybe... Can you take... I think you could take Riptides in squadrons back then, you know? So you could take nine Riptides in one formation. I can't remember actually. I've, I've blocked that memory out. I've blocked it out. So, imagine, but you, people turned up with nine Riptides, basically. Long story short, they turned up with nine Riptides. That, was, that wasn't uncommon. Nine Riptides, guys. Now, it would be bad enough that all of these Riptides could fire twice, just as per their data sheet. 
okay? So what the problem was that this Riptide Ring allowed people to just spam them, just really spam them to the nth degree. Okay, before, at least they were kind of limited, but this just allowed them to be spammed with no tax, no penalty. Because before, you might have been able to take loads of them in what was called your combined arms tax, which is essentially the same as a battalion these days. But they would be taxed, because you'd have to take a HQ, you'd have to take some troop choice, so it wasn't as super efficient. Well, the Riptide Wing let you do is simply take three units in one detachment, three units of Riptides, which meant there was no tax. They were super efficient. So that was the first thing. It took away all the tax from the existing Riptide spam, which was already a super powerful tactic that the Tau had. Then, you had a uh, special rule in this. This had a whole bunch of special rules. So the first one you had is coordinated attacks. In the shooting phase, add one to the skill of a Riptide from this formation if it shoots at a unit that has already been shot at at this phase by any other Riptide from this formation. So if one Riptide shoots at a unit, then all of the Riptides get plus one to hit. What's the biggest, what is the biggest problem that Tau had? Uh, Tau have that they, they're, they're big floors, they have good firepower but poor ballistic skill, a bit like the guard. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of limited by ballistic skill four plus. What if we just remove that ballistic skill? Okay, so they're all hitting on they're all hitting on threes now. Okay, so you've taken away the tax and now you have given them uh, you've taken away the biggest floor that their army has. Okay, cool. Then you'd go, okay, well, you know that Nova Reactor thing where they take wounds if they if they use the Nova Reactor. What if we just, if you just give them that a bit of the ability to re-roll that so that they only, they have to roll a one, they have to roll a one, re-roll it into another one for them to take any sort of damage. Okay, so basically you remove the, the disadvantage of the Nova Reactor. So they've got good ballistic skill and we remove the disadvantage of the Nova Reactor. That's great. Now if these things could already fire twice, but what if we let them fire Four times each. That's right. Games Workshop introduced a rule called Rap Riptide Hailfire, which meant, and it literally says this if the model uses Ripple Fire in the turn in which it makes a rapid Riptide Hailfire attack, it can fire the relevant weapon four times rather than twice. So imagine if every single Riptide, bearing in mind someone's using nine of the things, is always hitting on a three, has a, an amazing and vulnerable save, oh, and has four, is firing four times. It was just insane. There should be no ability for any unit to shoot four times. I mean, people already get pretty narky around abilities that let people shoot twice. I mean, just think, you know, you know, endless cacophony for care space marines. That stratagem that's basically keeping that codex afloat before it finally plunges beneath the waves. Endless, imagine if endless cacophony was across the whole space marine army, not just on one unit of obliterators, but across the whole space marine army. And instead of it letting you fire, and you could use it four times on each unit, three times on each unit, so each unit could fire four times, and it cost you no command points. That is what Riptide Wing let players do. That is why, when you put it on, when you read it out like that, when you give specific examples and you don't just say, oh, that's why you know formations are bad, okay? When you actually lay it out, it gives you an idea of how broken 7th edition was and how just unfun it was for certain factions. I mean, to give you an idea, you've just, you've just heard me talk about, you've just heard me talk about that, those Riptide wings, okay. But, you know, think of how powerful a Riptide is now. Think, imagine if a, if a, if a Riptide in 8th edition, you know, or 9th edition, could fire four times. Then bear in mind that the, the, the stat of a Guardsman hasn't changed. It hasn't, it hasn't changed in forever. How much damage in 9th edition could a Riptide do to a platoon of Guardsmen if it got to fire four times? And that's just one of them. Imagine if your opponent could turn it with nine of them. And that is why formations were so damning. That is why they almost killed the game, because people just stopped playing. It only took one person to turn up to a gaming group with one of these things, and it killed a gaming group. Because everyone got disillusioned with it. Everyone did. And that is why competitive 40k and that's why that's why the term like whacker and all this kind of thing has got such bad connotations 
okay? Because Games Workshop gave people the tools to be douchebags to each other. And people like to win. It's a competitive game. So they were douchebags to each other. But like I said, all it took is one douchebag turning up to his casual Friday evening gaming group with one of these things. And even if the rest of the players are like, we, yo, we don't want to play that anymore. You, you, once the genie's out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. People already had that knowledge. And you can't really fault the guy. I mean, he's turning up with legitimate rules. What are you going to tell him? Like, stop, stop being a dickhead. Kind of thing. You could say that, but then you, you're going to burn bridges there. And it's just awkward. It makes confrontation. It just, it's just toxic. It's toxic when you start telling people what they can and can't turn up with when they've paid their money and they've painted their models and they've built that army. So it was just bad. So that is why, for you new players, this is a 25-minute video trying to explain it, but I don't think I've ever just gone into the in-depth reason behind it before. I've never actually just sat down and given examples and spoken about the bullshittery. Um, but for new players out there who maybe joined an eighth, didn't really quite get the, the murmurings around special attachments and who really didn't get why people were so up in arms around regiments for now, now you know. Now you know why people are so pissed off about it. Or, or I mean, I'm, why people just don't like the, the, any any kind of idea, any sort of whiff of formation or formation-like things back in 40k. That's why people just go nuts about it. Because it literally almost killed the game that we know and love today. And anyway, guys, that's it. That's it. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of examples of formations that I haven't talked about. Necron Decurion was a particularly particularly obnoxious offender but if there's any examples of your favorite formation or your should i say most should I say least favorite formation that you had to encounter that i haven't mentioned in this video please put it down in the comment section below if you like the idea of regiments of renown you know let me know i mean i'm open to it do you think the, the controversy is justified do you think people should be up in arms about it or do you think it's not a big deal as far as I'm aware, Games Workshop hasn't revealed whether they're four match play or not yet. I think that's the big question. That's the big elephant in the room. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. But the couple of regiments of renown that they have released have definitely got some strongness to them. Definitely got some strong, strong. Yeah, they're good. So we'll have to see if they make it into match play. It's going to start causing serious ripples. Serious ripples. Anyway, guys, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Please leave lots of comments. If you'd like to support the channel further, I do have a Patreon page. It will be linked down in the description below. Massive thank you to all my Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome, and it's thanks to you that I am able to do awesome projects like the upcoming Mordian Glory Battle Bunker, which I will be revealing more information about that as the weeks go on. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, and of course, I'll see you guys next time.